Man, anybody can preach after that kind of an introduction. That's awesome. Thank you to our media team. Thank you, Sam Brownback, for putting that together. Y'all doing good today? This is a great day, not only to be alive, but to be in the house. Hallelujah. Even if it's your house, to be together because the presence of God is here right now. He is here today. We've been taking a look at the names of God and un- seeing God unveil, reveal who He is through His names. For us to get to know Him better and to see His character, His attributes demonstrated in our life by the demonstration of His name. So our core scripture where we're starting every week is Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. How many of you realize our safety net, our safety zone, our shelter is inside his name? It's not behind a mask, but it's in his name. I'm just saying, okay? The safe place is in his name. No matter whether you wear masks or stay at home, if you're not inside his name, you're not safe. Smile behind your mask. So today, we're going to take a look at two names specifically. We're moving from, we've been talking about God as El, El Roy last week, Perianne covered Elohim the week before that. And now we're moving into the personal name of God where he revealed himself to Moses as Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh, much centuries later through a group of European monks, they changed the name, they they tried to update and add vowels. So from the Hebrew Yahweh, they created the name Jehovah. So when we say or you hear the name Jehovah, it's really Yahweh. Okay, so you'll know that it's all the same, but in Hebrew it's it's Y H W H, and Yahweh is not even the Hebrew way to pronounce it. But I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not even going to try to say what it is because it's just like a guttural breath that comes out. Because God is breath; He is spirit. And so Yahweh is his personal name and how he revealed himself to Moses and then began throughout history to reveal himself to the Israelites as Yahweh the Lord. Okay, And so even the Hebrews, they so hallow or, or believe the name is holy that they will not speak the name out loud. Because to speak the name is to release the presence, is to demonstrate the person. So when you speak a person's name, you're actually calling for their presence. And that's, you know, if you're, if you're in sin and you speak the name of God calling for the holiness of God, that can be a scary thing. So that's why in Hebrew culture, they won't speak the name of God out loud. Today, we're going to talk about Yahweh and how he's revealed himself two specific ways. Yahweh Rohi in the Hebrew, which is the Lord, my shepherd, and Yahweh Shama, the Lord who is there. Everybody say, the Lord, my shepherd, the Lord who is there. He is there. There, hallelujah. We're going to take a look at it it specifically in the context, in the life, and the situation of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is what scholars call the charismatic prophet. He is the most New Testament charismatic. We're not talking about a great personality. We're talking about charismatic in terms of Holy Spirit, dreams, visions, and manifestations. Ezekiel got caught up into the heavenlies. He had dreams and visions or caught up into heavenlies and was given a tour of heaven and given a tour of the future. And so he's considered the most charismatic of the Old Testament prophets. He prophesied in a time period 
of captivity. It was at the very beginning, uh, shortly after Babylon, uh, the Babylonians took the, the Hebrews into captivity. And so he was a prophet in Babylon. He was actually in the area of the Chaldeans and by the river Kedar. And so you have a group of people, the Israelites, you have a, a nation of people who have been taken out of their homeland and they have been shipped away to be captives, to be slaves, to be servants to another nation. And how many of you realize that's not a happy situation? You've been taken out of your home, you've been shipped away, and now you're serving another country, you're serving another king, you've lost your identity, um, you are struggling to be the people of God, to be your family in somebody else's culture, somebody else's nation. And so Psalm 137 is a great expression of, of the people of Israel during that exile period. So let's take a quick look at that. It says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. They're homesick. They're homesick for their identity. They're homesick for the presence of God. They're homesick for their worship of God in the temple. They're homesick for their home city and their home culture. It says, there on the willows we hung our harps. For there our captors requested a song. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. Sing us a song of Zion. How can we sing a song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand cease to function. You know what your right hand is used for? It's your strumming hand. So he say, they're saying, we, they're, they're depressed. Let's put it in Western terminology. They should be on Zoloft. They are depressed. They're unhappy. They have been captured away and they are homesick for their own culture, for the presence of God, to sing the songs of Zion, to sing the songs of praise. But they can't sing praise because they are depressed. So they have hung their harps in the willows. And their captors just want entertainment because their captors like the songs. Their captors remember the joyful songs that they made in their culture and their tormentors are saying, hey, play us a song, not a dirge, but we want a song. We want one of your happy songs, entertain us. But they can't find inside themselves the joy, they can't find themselves inside themselves the strength to put on a happy face and praise God. So in that context, God raises up a prophet named Ezekiel. And Ezekiel has a message for them. He has two primary messages throughout the book with all the visions. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of the whole book of Ezekiel. Is that okay? Two messages. Number one, the responsibility for personal sin. Each individual must accept personal responsibility for national calamity. In other words, you made this bed, you're lying in it, you made the choices, you've got to live with it. You are responsible for the condition that you are in today. Listen, we're in America we don't like the situation we're in right now, but I believe that if the church of Jesus Christ would recognize that we as a nation have actually given ourselves as a culture over to sin and that we need to repent. We need to cry out to God. Chaos needs to call to the chaos in God and say we need help. We need to take responsibility that this situation has come upon us not because of what they did, but because of what we've done or because of what we haven't done. 
personal responsibility for sin. And then secondly, aren't you glad that God doesn't leave us in the responsibility of our sin? He doesn't leave us alone. The very next message of Ezekiel, the, the whole last half of the book of Ezekiel is filled with hope. It is restoration by divine grace. We don't have to rebuild ourselves. We don't, after we repent for sin, we don't have to put it all back together. If we'll repent and call on the name of the Lord, by His grace, He will restore. He will rebuild. He will bring us back to Him. He will bring prosperity back to us. Hallelujah. Repentance of the remnant will result in the recreation of the nation. So the last half of the book of Ezekiel is amazing. It starts in like chapter 37, which is maybe a little bit more than half. But in around 37, it's you know the, the story where he prophesies to the valley of dry bones, right? And there's a rattling and a shaking and the bones come together. And he prophesies for flesh to come onto the bones. The prophet's prophesying to the nation for the remnant to come back together and then to the four winds to fill with breath and with life the army of God and raise it up. And then he prophesies about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And he's prophesies and he goes into great detail. And, he, and, and in chapter 47 he talks about a, a throne is there where God will dwell and a river will come out from under the throne and will fill the city. And it will be deep and wide and you won't be able to cross the river. And so he prophesies about the glory of God filling the city. Hallelujah. What's he doing? One, he's telling what God's will is. And the will of God gives them hope. They will not be in captivity forever. They will not be there for, for, forever. But God will bring them back to their homeland. He will rebuild their city. He will rebuild their culture. They're going to sing songs in Zion again. They're going to bring out their harps. And they're going to sing. And they're going to dance. They're going to worship. And the glory of the Lord's going to fill the house. Hallelujah. He's giving them hope. He's moving them out of their depression and into hope. So when he, in that process, in chapter 34, Ezekiel prophesies specifically to what he calls the shepherds. The shepherds when you study it out, I, you know, I, I was thinking, is he talking to priests? Is he talking to the scribes, the teachers, the Pharisee? Who's he talking to here? And all the scholars and historians bear out that actually he's speaking to the kings. He's speaking to civil government. He's speaking to Jehoiakim and to Zedekiah, who were the kings of Judah before the exile. So he's talking about government and how the how they ruled the nation of Israel and he's bringing a judgment on the way that they ruled so I know it's a lot of words but follow along he says son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel prophesy and tell them that this is what the Lord God says woe to the shepherds of Israel who only feed themselves ouch should not the shepherds feed their flock? You eat the fat and you wear the wool and the butcher and the fat and sheep, but you do not feed the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bound up the injured, brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. This is what the Lord God says. Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will demand from them my flock and remove them from tending the flock so that they can no longer feed themselves. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. He is going to get rid of selfish leaders who lead for self-gain. To feed themselves. He is correcting leadership 
over the nation. And he's saying, I'm just going to step in and take over myself. I'm going to remove them. And he did that by removing the people out from under their leadership and doing away with the kings called captivity. With the promise that when they return, he will be their shepherd. Okay? So, let's read on a little bit further because the promise is he will become their shepherd. For this is what the Lord God says, Behold, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. As a shepherd looks for his scattered sheep when he is among the flock, so I will look for my flock. I will tend my flock and make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and bring back the strays, bind up the broken, strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd them with justice. I will make with them a covenant of peace and rid the land of wild animals so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the forest. And I will raise up for them a garden of renown and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people declares the Lord God. You are my flock, the sheep of my pasture, my people, and I am your God, declares the Lord. That is Jehovah Rohi. I am your shepherd. I will care for you. I will bring you back home. I'll heal your brokenness. I will supply you a garden that's going to fulfill you and satisfy you with good things. Hallelujah. I will give you pastures to lie down in. I'll lead you beside still waters. I'll restore your soul for my name's sake, Psalm 23 says. That is the Lord's shepherding heart for his people, for you and for me. Hallelujah. He knows how to find you. I wasn't raised in Pentecost, but I've heard the stories about the hounds of heaven. Anybody hear about the hounds of heaven? Some old Pentecostal saints. Yeah, a couple of them. How you can't run away from God because he'll send the hounds of heaven. The Holy Ghost angels will come find you. There is a guy in, the, in, in the, one of the parables of Jesus, we call him the prodigal son, who was out, <laughs> ran from and turned away his father's inheritance and went out into, into the world, squandered all of his wealth, and ended up just eating pig slop but came to the end of himself. And when he came to the end of himself, he says, I will return home. Why? Because the Holy Ghost knew where he was at. The Holy Ghost met him in that place, the hounds of heaven, if you will, and drew him back home. The Lord knows how to shepherd his people. He knows how to find the lost and draw them back home. Listen, I hear the Holy Ghost saying right now, he knows how to find some of your children and bring them back home. He knows where they're at. He knows the mess that they're in. And he knows how to bring them to the end of themselves so that they will wake up and come back home where they belong. Jesus reveals himself as the good shepherd. He says, Truly I tell you, whoever does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen for his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. That tells me that sheep recognize when their name's called. That when he speaks your name, you'll hear it and recognize it. Sheep recognize their name and he leads them out and when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger, in fact, They will flee from him because they do not recognize his voice. 
What do you think is a defining factor here of who belongs to the Lord? They recognize His voice. Can I just say it this way? You don't need Old Testament, Old Covenant rules and guidelines and laws when you have the voice of the Lord. When you recognize the voice of your shepherd, your shepherd you will follow and the voice of a stranger you will not follow. The key to New Testament discipleship, the key to New Testament growth and leadership is to recognize the voice of Jesus in your inner sanctum, in your heart, in your life and be be able to discern his voice and follow him hallelujah it's following his voice not crossing all the T's dotting all the I's doing all the the activities of Christian service if you follow his voice you might do the right ones you might do the ones you're gifted at hallelujah hallelujah You might actually bear some fruit. I'm just saying. Did I say that? I did. He goes on to say, this is Jesus. He says, I am the good shepherd. Yahweh, Rohi. Yahweh means what? I am that I am. Rohi, the shepherd. He revealing himself that He is the shepherd. He is Jehovah Rohi. He is Yahweh Rohi, the shepherd. And then he gives, we understand now what it means to be a sheep is to follow his voice. But now he gives us a definition of leadership in the kingdom. He says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. And the sheep are not his own. When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock, the man runs away because he's a hired servant and is unconcerned for the sheep. Can I, I, I'm not asking your permission, I'm going to say it anyway. Can you hear me when I say, here at the Abbey, the number one qualification for growth and leadership is self-sacrifice for the love and the care of the people. It's all about that. It's not about position. It's not first about gifting. It's about the heart to sacrifice self, to sacrifice your convenience, to sacrifice your comfort, to care for other people. It's the heart of a shepherd. Because that's the kingdom value of leadership. If we don't have that, it doesn't matter how big of a church we have. It's not kingdom. Okay? Remember Ezekiel 34? I'm just saying. Okay? He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Can I just say this? I'm going to again. (laughs) This is why we don't have to like fight for sheep among the churches I believe Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 God sets in the church according to his will how does he do that I believe he assigns people to a pastor's voice and they recognize the voice inside the voice And they recognize I'm assigned to that voice. And God connects people. I don't want anybody that's not assigned to this to 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 our voice. I want them to find where they're assigned. And support there. Come on now, we're one body. So we don't own sheep. They follow the voice that God assigns them to that they're connected with. Okay, just extra. I won't charge you for it. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Outside Israel, 
Gentiles. I must bring them in as well and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Many races, many nations, many kindred, many tongues, one flock, one shepherd. The reason the Father loves me is that I lay down my life in order to take it up again. Do you think maybe when Jesus says something three different times, he, we might ought to listen to him? Three different times he talks about the shepherd is the one who lays his life down for the sheep. It's leadership sacrifices itself for the good, the love of the sheep. Somebody say amen. Peter writing to the Hebrews that were scattered abroad outside the nation of Israel, the, outside the land of Israel. And they were being tempted to go after coming to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. The Judaizers were coming and telling them, no, you need to come back under the ceremonial law. You, faith in Jesus is not enough. You have to come back into Judaism in, under the ceremonial law. You have to do all the, all the ceremonies and keep the law perfect. That's the basis of your righteousness. And Peter responds to them in his letter. And he, he says this. He quotes a lot of Isaiah chapter 53 talking about how Jesus as a Messiah was the sacrificial lamb that took away all of our sin. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And then the next statement is the next verse in Isaiah 53, for you were like sheep going astray. Everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. They were all going their own way. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. Now you've come back home inside the fold where you are cared for by a shepherd. You are cared for by an overseer, one whose voice will lead you and guide you and watch out for you. You've come into the fold. So don't leave the shepherd to go back into a law. Let me, put it, let me put it this way. I don't know if you've noticed, about, noticed this about sheep. I'm not around sheep much, so I haven't noticed a lot, but there are sheep farmers somewhere. Farmers? Is that sheep ranchers? Herders. Because a shepherd. Help me preach. That's just a test. Can I, can I, I, I like I said, I haven't done this research, but it, I don't think sheep are their healthiest and grow their strongest in a pen. I think they're healthiest and grow their strongest when they go out to pasture, when they walk and climb across the mountains and the hills, and they can, they, they are, can we call them free roaming sheep? <laughs> free range sheep. Making up words. Are you following me? So a shepherd does, the goal of a shepherd is not to keep them in a pen, right? Listen, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law, literally the Pharisees called it fencing. The law, they would interpret, the Talmud was an interpretation of the, of the law to keep you out of sin. So they, they called it fencing as they would interpret, well, the, the, the word says, the commandment says, don't honor the Sabbath, don't do any work. So the interpretation of that, the fence we're going to build to make sure that you don't get to do any work, is now in modern day interpretation, the rabbis of today define that as on a Sabbath day, on a Saturday, you cannot get up from your lazy boy and walk across the room and turn off the light switch because that would be defined as work. Right? So that's a fence. How many of you realize that, that doesn't make healthy sheep? 
Going through all the rules doesn't make healthy sheep. That's just fencing you into a smaller and smaller pen. What you need is a shepherd who will lead you out and will feed you in green pastures. Hallelujah. Will restore your soul to enjoy deep waters. A mountain brook. I am about to go to Colorado. I'll see you when I get back. All right. He is Jehovah Rohi. He is the Lord our shepherd. He is also Jehovah Shammah. So I took this from Ezekiel because here's a people who are in captivity and he is saying, I will be your shepherd. Your shepherds have abused you and treated you violently and cruelly. I will be your shepherd. And then he ends the whole of the book of Ezekiel. The final words of the final vision. The final vision is the new Jerusalem. And he gives great detail of the size, the the dimensions of the city and the apportioning of the land to the different tribes of Israel. And he describes the city in detail and then he names the city. He gives the city a name and he says "Oh, the, in, from that day on in verse 35 of chapter 48, the last verse of Ezekiel, he says from that day on the name of the city will be the Lord is there. The name of the city is the Lord is there. And remember what we said, to speak the name is to release the attributes. So to declare Yahweh Shammah, the Lord is there, is to release the presence of God in that place. So in that day, the name of the city will be the Lord is there is to say the city will be filled with the glory of the Lord. It will be the dwelling place on earth of God's presence. Remember a few weeks ago we even talked about Solomon dedicating the temple. This really is going back to that. When he dedicated the temple, the glory of the Lord filled. He kept Fire came from heaven, consumed the sacrifices, and the glory filled the temple such that the priests couldn't even stand and do their duty. Everybody was on their face. And the Lord said, I will make my name dwell there. That is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. Hallelujah. We've said it this way before. How many of you realize sometimes the Lord, the Lord is omniscient, he's omniscient, all-knowing, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, but sometimes he's more somewhere than otherwhere. Sometimes he's more there, more, more there than here, sometimes he's more here than there. So Jehovah Shammah is to say the Lord is in that place with his manifest glory. Interesting. Jesus declares in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 is a, is, a, is a beautiful discourse by the Lord. Remember chapter 16 is where Peter, where Jesus asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter answers and says, you, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he talks about revelation, that flesh and blood's not revealed that to you. And he says, he, and he talks about, um, I will build my Thank you. I'm just checking. Y'all still here. At home, I heard you. Church. You said it before they did here. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he, he uses the word ecclesia for church, called out ones. It's really the same word as city government. It's not the word for synagogue. It's really a word for government. So it's it for the for the disciples, it was like probably. What? 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 You, you're going to build not not a religious gathering. You're going to build a government, and that's really what he was saying. I will build a government, a kingdom that will carry my presence, my values, my culture, my presence. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's been increasing across the earth ever since he made that statement. 
Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end, Isaiah says in 9.6. Are you with me? So from that statement, there has been a marching forward and expansion of the government and the kingdom of God. And so right on through Matthew 18, Jesus is unpacking a lot of what this government, what this church thing is, and what it'll look like. And in chapter 18, he talks about uh, forgiveness and, and accountability and, and walking together in agreement And he says this, he's talking about spiritual authority in the heavenlies by the church. And he says, again, I tell you truly that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, there am I with them. There I am with them. Shama Yahweh in the midst of them. How many of you realize Jesus didn't speak Greek? I mean, he probably could, but his language was either Aramaic, because that was the common, or Hebrew. So he might have actually used the words Shama Yahweh. I am. The Lord present there with you. What did he do? He just took Ezekiel 48, 35, Jehovah Shammah, out of a physical location and put it every place. There's two or more gathered in his name. Every place you come together, he says, glory is here. I am there. My authority is there when you come together. Ah, ah. Perry Ann and I have a little thing. It's just our thing. We can't do our thing. This is our thing. If you do it, keep it to yourself. But we have a little thing from our background and this scripture. So usually before... Before we go do something, before we part ways, before one of our kids uh, drive off to go to Kansas, before, before something that is, is happening in our life, we come together in agreement. And King James says, if two of you will agree as touching, I wasn't going to do this, but come here, Brian. I'm not, I got to do it. Give her a big hand. So sometimes, sometimes I'll be in my truck about ready to pull out of the driveway. This happened a couple of days ago. And, and we're, we're going to go two different things, go two different ways. And she goes, well, let's agree. So she'll come to the truck and I'll put my, I'll put my hand up on the window and she'll, she'll, She'll come and do that, and we agree. come on now. We, you're embarrassed. I'm embarrassing you. This is. I know that turnabout's fair pay, play, pay. Yeah, yeah. So we'll say, okay, we agree as touching. So we have to touch. We have to touch. The whole demonstration was us touching. Was us touching. We we because it's an it's a point of contact on the word of God. It's a it's a way for us. I was going to say there's nothing special about touching, but there is. It's a point of contact. It's a way to release your faith. We agree as touching this thing in the name of Jesus that this will be the outcome. The promise of God gives us this promise for this outcome, for the outcome of safety, for the outcome of provision, for the outcome of prosperity. So we agree as touching that thing together in the name of Jesus, and we receive it done In Jesus' name, according to our faith. Sometimes, sometimes, yes. It doesn't take a lot. I'm just saying. I am the Lord who is there. We agree together. Where two or more are in agreement, the Lord is there. The Lord is where? 
It helps when here is there and there is here. Listen, in 1973, the Lord was there in my dining room in Omaha, Nebraska, when my cousin came home from Vietnam, full of the Holy Ghost, and we're sitting at the dining room table, and he starts telling me about praying in tongues and the Holy Ghost, and I started having chills all up and down my spine. My hair stands up, and and I chill bumps all up and down my arms, and he says, That's the presence of God. That's the Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh no, no, I'm just cold. (laughs) I scared to death is what I was because it was real. The Lord was there in my dining room. And it was within weeks after that that I had an encounter and a vision of Jesus in my bedroom in the middle of the night. And I gave my heart to the Lord and he called me. That The Lord was there. In 1978, for my life, I had a full scholarship to a private university in Ottawa, Kansas for pre-med, and I go and I visit, and it was fine. It's a great university. They had an over 80% success rate of graduates in pre-med got accepted into med school. That's pretty good. So in, in a lot of ways, my life was lined out. If I go to school there, it'd be paid for, and I could probably go straight from there to KU medical school just uh, uh, just a little bit down the road and I would be a doctor and I'd be rich but then something happened my mom said why don't we go look at Oral Roberts University I'm like okay mom fine that's what you want to do mom okay so we drove to Tulsa And we drove to 7777 South Lewis Avenue in Tulsa, Oral Roberts University, drove onto the campus, and the presence of God, the presence of God just came all over me. And I just, I I don't know that I had the words, but I knew in my spirit, the Lord is here. For me, the Lord is here. I didn't have a scholarship, I didn't have a guarantee, but I knew that this was the place of of destiny, this is where I was supposed to go, that the Lord was there. So I turned down my scholarship, my dad said, you what? Mom said, we'll figure it out. (laughs) And we did. The grace of God provided. And I paid for that grace for about 10 years. (laughs) But the Lord was there. The Lord was there because that's where I got really full of the Holy Ghost. That's where I got a vision to to take the the gospel into every man's world. That's where I met Perry Ann. That's where we got a vision for the world. That's where everything changed because of a vision that Oral had to take the gospel and the healing power of God into every man's world. What he had on the outside got on the inside of me by the Holy Ghost. 1981 in that process, I have what I call my summer of discontent. No, I won't answer any questions about that. But it was immediately followed by the fall of fulfillment. I came back from a summer of frustration to ORU in the fall. And in that fall, that's, that's actually when I met Perry Ann, I'm just saying And so that's when we started going to a church in North Tulsa. And that's when the revelation of the word began to open up in my life. And it was a little tiny place called Tulsa Christian Center. And, And I mean, there was probably 30 people in that church. But the revelation of the word just flowed out of the out of the leaders, and I found out my identity in Christ. I found out about the righteousness of God. I found out about the grace of God. I found out about what happened from the cross to the throne room. I found out how in the spirit the Holy Ghost in me is greater than he that's in the world. It shifted things in my life and transformed me. The Lord was there. Hallelujah. In 1987, as a church, we were in a very different church environment. And God was moving 
and what God was doing in new wine in, the, in our hearts and a vision for the kingdom, can I just say it this way, wouldn't fit into an old wineskin. So God birthed in our spirits a vision for a new church. So we said, let's just plant something new. Let's give them since this building, not this one, but the one we were in at the time. Since this building is so important to them, let's give them the building because we want the presence. So let's take the presence and go start something new on Smelly Road Cattle Baron's <laughs> restaurant. So we started a new church in a, what do you call it? Not a cow pasture, but yeah, it was smelly, just saying. So we, we started and birthed a new church, a kingdom work that you are a part of today. Because we had, God put in our hearts a vision for you. A vision for you one day. That there would be something new and a new wineskin that would hold new wine. To release the gifts of God in life. So, 19, the Lord was there on Smelly Road at Cattle Barons. In 1993, the Lord was there when we... <laughs> it was a crazy morning. We were on Flat Rock Road in the old little metal building that we were in, that we were in, in the 90s. And on a Sunday morning... We were having worship. Roy, Roy Burns was leading worship. And I just remember being on the platform, getting ready to step up for prayer and transition from worship to the Word. And it was like a bomb went off. In the summer of, 80, of 93. And Roy Burns started laughing. And stumbling and laughing hilariously and stumbling around. And the worship team started laughing and stumbling. And we all started laughing and stumbling around like, what is going on? The glory of God poured out and the joy of the Lord. Right before Rodney Howard Brown came to Fort Worth at Calvary Cathedral, downtown Fort Worth. And we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know who this South African was. But right at that time, the glory of God hit our church. And a move of God that started in June of 93 that really continues... Through today, it's shifted and changed in how it expresses, gets expressed, but it was the value of the presence of God in a way that we never knew before. That we literally said, oh, this is that. Oh, this is what that's talking about. Oh, what we, what we had heard about. Now we, are, we taste and see. The Lord was there. And I could go on and on and on. In 2007, oh, that's a long story. But in 2007, we knew the Lord called us to be Main Street. And we searched and found this place. This blank piece of property. Go ahead, worship team. You can come. And... We didn't know that it was a promised piece of property, that it was the exact same piece of property in 1987 that Kerry Wood had tried to buy and they wouldn't sell him. And so the same exact piece of property that God called us to and put a dream in leaders' hearts in 87, we bought in 2007 and we built the first building which is now our children's wing. The Lord was there. In 2007, in 2009, it expanded to this, and the Lord was there. Every situation, Jehovah, Shammah, the Lord 
was there. This week, I don't know if many of you know, but our very own Toby Paletti had a heart attack. What day was that? Tuesday? Calls me from, calls or, calls or text, and I call him, and he's in the ambulance on his way to the hospital. We pray with him in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. He gets into, gets to the hospital in Harris Southwest, and they wheel him into the catheterization room, which you're awake during. They say, they ask him, what kind of music do you want to listen to during this catheterization? What kind of music do you want to listen to while we're checking out your heart? And he said, well, do you have any contemporary Christian music? And they smile and said, we do. So they put on Bethel Worship. The whole team in the operating room, the whole team gathers around him and prays over him before they start the procedure. And guess what? The Lord was there. The Lord was there. And they did the procedure and they say, well, we don't know what happened, but you have zero blockages. Zero. Nothing wrong with your heart. The Lord was there. I got a testimony this week from Kathy Rule, who has Kathy. Some of you will know Kathy. Kathy teaches English as a second language in China. Um, she's she's taught all over, and and she's back here now. And she was on a Skype with somebody in France and in. Oh, I want to say somewhere in Africa. And while they were on Skype call together in a conference call, the Lord showed up. And began. they began to prophesy. And the dreams of God came out how God is going to use them as educators in this season to, see, to, to be a part of the move of God in the nations around the world. The Lord was there this week on that conference call the declaration over the city of Jerusalem the Lord the name of it is the Lord of the Lord is there was about Israel's future can I just tell you I'm going I keep asking you but I'm telling you anyway the the Lord is there is the name of your dreams and vision those dreams and visions those those ideas those desires didn't come from just you the Lord placed those inside you and he is there in your future waiting hallelujah John 14 Jesus said I go ahead and I prepare a place for you so that where I am I can receive you unto myself listen he's waiting in your future That place is not just heaven when you die. That place is your destiny. That place is your future. This is not the end of your life. This is not the rest of your life. But your dreams and visions, He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. The Lord is there. So He's telling some people to get up and go there. Quit being here because the Lord is there. Get up and move forward in your dreams and visions because the Lord is there. He's Jehovah Shammah. Somebody else needs to stand up with me this morning and begin to declare the Lord is there. This is time to not hang up our hearts. We are not going to hang our harps on willows. We are going to sing the songs of Zion. We, it's time to sing the songs of joy because the Lord is there. So I just keep hearing this this morning. I'm not going to hang up my harp. I'm not going to hang up my harp. I'm just like my country, I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. I'm not going to hang up my heart. I'm not going to hang up my heart. I'm just like my kingdom. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. I'm not going to hang up my heart. Somebody that's older than me needs to say, begin to declare that with me. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. 
The spirit of Joshua and Caleb is coming on somebody that you have waited, but you're not done. God still has your mountain. Your dreams are still in your future. I'm not going to hang up my heart. I'm just like my kingdom. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry. I'm not going to hang up my heart. I'm not going to throw away my shot. I am going to do the will of God. I'm going to stand up and take my mountain. The Lord is there. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to declare today, the Lord is there. Okay, so this morning I printed this word out. The printer happens to be next to where Paul is studying, and I printed this out for me, and he brought it downstairs, and he said, you're going to read that at church? And I went, oh, and he said that it is totally what he was preaching. And so we've been shouting, but I want to guarantee you that Jehovah Rohi and Jehovah Shama are one and the same, and this yeah. word addresses both of that. So I'm just going to declare this over us. I feel like that this prophet guy that I follow, I feel like he's he's speaking at the Abbey today, and I'm gonna I'm gonna send him an offering because I feel like he's helping us minister today. Receive this in your heart. The Father says today, I am restoring you to wholeness of heart. Your heart was broken and torn in many directions in times past. All that ends now. I am holding your heart in my hand and blowing upon it with my breath as a man would blow upon a coal of fire. Your rejoicing is coming back. Your joy is now restored. Wait, can you hear it? In your heart, even now, the faint music of celebration is rising within you with the trumpets of praise, blasting out all the depression, anxiety, and sadness. Sadness is not your portion, says God. I am your maker, and every one of your days is written in my book. The epistle of your life is a success story, a romance, an epic of triumph and victory, not a tragic cautionary tale of failure or disappointment. Your enemies are turned back. They perish at my presence. I have maintained your right and your cause, and the gavel now comes down in your favor. The destructions of the destroyer in your life have come to a perpetual end. Now beauty takes the place of ashes, and the spirit of heaviness is displaced, displaced by joy unspeakable and full of glory. Say in your heart, and this is going to be a challenge for somebody, but I believe you need to do it. Say in your heart, this is where it gets easy. I am all about yoke easy and burden light. Make the proclamation, what else could possibly go right? For that is the threshold you cross over this very day. You have crossed over this very day. Believe the good report, says God. Refuse to wallow in the negative. Give me some cooperation and I will give you some change. Whoa! Hallelujah. Whoa! Whoa! Oh! That one again. Give me some cooperation and I will give you some change. Ho! Oh. <laughs> Let your eyes be lightened with the promise of my word and the expectation of your heart be above only and not beneath. Despisers will despise and perish, but a credulous faith-believing people will inherit the land and divide the heathen spoil for their inheritance. Hey! <laughs> Woo! Oh. Yeah. I'm going to invite you yeah. both here as well as at home, wherever you're at, would you make these declarations with me as a point of contact to release your faith today? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I declare today. I declare today. I'm not going to hang up my heart. I'm not going to hang up my heart. 
I declare today. I declare today. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing the songs of, jo- of Zion. The songs of Zion. The songs of joy. The songs of joy. I choose today. I choose today to lift my voice. To lift my voice with joy. With joy. In praise to my God. In praise to my God. I declare today. I declare today the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Is my strength. Jehovah Shammah. Jehovah Shammah. He is there. He is there. He is here. He is here. In my situation. In my situation. In my tomorrow. In my tomorrow. In my dream. In my dream. In my vision. In my vision. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Waiting for me. Waiting for to me. To show up. To show up. I will show up. I will show up. And he will show out. And he will show out. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. I declare today. I declare today. What else is gonna go right? 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 Now give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 Before we go today, I just want to release uh, two prophetic words of healing. Somebody in your lower back on the right side, like from your spine to your hip, to your lower back. I saw the Lord healing that, restoring that, loosening that, releasing that. Migraine headaches, see like tunnel vision, just opening from from migraines that make you just want to shut your eyes. I just see it opening and releasing and lifting right now in the name of Jesus. So Lord, we release your healing power. You are there in those places in people's lives in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. If you're at home and you have a prayer request, please send us an email to hope at theabbeychurch.com. We have a prayer team that will pray with you. If you are a prodigal and want to come home, send us that email. Someone will reach out to you. Send us your phone number. We'll call you. We're praying for you. God bless you. Same thing right here. We love you. We're praying for you. And we're not going to hang up our hearts. Amen. Amen. God bless you. joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you, and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook, 
and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news, as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.